when you look at what's going on in the world today, it leads to a lot of questions like what in the world is going on? Um, it seems like people uh, all around the world uh, will do almost anything to either stay in power or to seize power. Um, having just come back not long ago from uh, Israel, uh, it it's always reminds me of how volatile the area is over there because you have uh, Hezbollah and Hamas on Israel's borders uh, with one end in mind, and that's to obliterate Israel, and they're always looking toward that end. They actually had a, a terror attack while we were in Jerusalem, in old Jerusalem, the day we were there. We heard the sirens. What in the world? Um, uh, Iran and its proxies uh, always looking uh, for opportunities to rattle their proverbial saber and intimidate uh, anyone and everyone, uh, especially in the Persian Gulf. Uh, why can't they just live at peace? Um, Chinese military, as we know, especially at this time with the COVID crisis, seems to be exercising uh, their um, uh, naval muscle in the South China Sea. Uh, again, w why can't they just live at peace? Why is there so much um, hatred and animosity between the nations? Uh, Islamists that are embedded in Western nations uh, are pushing for Sharia law uh, to replace the law of the, of the countries wherein they live. Uh, creating uh, little countries inside their countries. So what in the world is going on there? Uh, we could go on through all the nations to understand that uh, totalitarianism, despotism uh, is, is on the rise, uh, even in our own country. Uh, you have to ask yourself, well, will, the, will the godless succeed in creating their version of a, of a utopia? Because that's what all of these organizations are looking for, whether it's a, uh, it's a religious belief system or it's an ideological geopolitical belief system. They're all vying for the fact that they can create their version of heaven on earth, their version of a utopia. Will they succeed? Well, uh, from what we know of the scriptures, they'll only succeed in a temporal fashion uh, when the man of sin arrives, the lawless one, as Paul prophesies concerning him uh, in Second Thessalonians, when the man of sin comes, the Antichrist, uh, he will seize the power controls of the world and establish world peace, but it's only going to be temporary. Uh, his uh, particular kingdom, uh, from what we know uh, from the prophets, especially from uh, Daniel's pen, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Revelation uh, at the end of the New Testament, chapter 13, uh, tells us that at the end of time, we can expect that when the man of sin rises to power, uh, he will take this quest for power, this quest for total rulership and dominion over people to an, a level not even seen before in history. He will be, according to John in Revelation 13, the, uh, the essence of all the major empires of the world wrapped up into one. John, John calls him actually a monster. Uh, it's a monster kingdom. So everything that the Babylonian kingdom was uh, in a negative fashion, everything the Medo-Persians were, the swiftness of the Grecian Empire with Alexander the Great, etc., the bone-crushing nature of the Roman army, all will be rolled up into this one particular kingdom. Why do we stop to look at this as we look at Psalm 2? Well, the answer is simple. Uh, is Psalm 2 is telling you where history is going. Because we can look at history and say it looks like it's out of control. Uh, you know, despotism, totalitarian regimes seem to be popping up everywhere. People are trying to exercise control over other people through a variety of means. Uh, what is going on here? There, from my perspective, there, we, the world stage is merely being set for the man of sin. That he will arise uh, and he will present himself as the man of peace. Uh, and he, he will have this monster kingdom to dominate the world. Uh, but Psalm 2 is... Um, well, it's a, it's a psalm of great hope uh, because as you watch the world uh, descend into darkness uh, and, and being set up and prepared for the, the reign of the Antichrist, uh, here you have in Psalm 2 God's definitive answer to what the devil thinks he's going to be able to do. Psalm 2 is uh, basically uh, not a speed bump to the devil's kingdom. Uh, it's, a, it's a massive wall. Uh, you know, it's so thick, there's no way the de devil could penetrate it. There's no way that the devil in, is going to be able to stop the coming of the king of kings. No way. Uh, and I don't know where you are right now, around the kitchen table, in the living room. Uh, you should be saying amen to that because there's no way that the, that the devil and his minions and all those people that follow the devil uh, and who want power for themselves and will then give their power over to his, his uh, leader will ever stop the coming of the kingdom of Christ. That's what Psalm 2 is about. There is a, an, another old hymn. We looked at one for during the, communion, uh, the uh, giving time. There's another old hymn. Uh, used to sing when I was a kid, and it always made me stop and think about myself, because the question of the hymn was this, what if it were today? That's the title of the hymn, what if it were today? Uh, and it's one of those uh, second coming kind of hymns uh, that makes you stop and think like, well, what if this was the day that Jesus came back? 
Notice the words. Jesus is coming to earth again. What if it were today? Coming in power and in love to reign. What if it were today? Satan's dominion will then be o'er. Uh, what if it were today? Sorrow and sighing shall be no more. Oh, that it were today. Uh, an amazing song because it tells you in a definitive fashion uh, the evil that you see, the darkness that you see spreading uh, in our country and around the world of man's love and quest for power to build his version of a utopia apart from God is going to run headlong into the kingdom of Christ and nothing will stop it. That is Psalm 2, verses 1 to 12. The main motif of Psalm uh, 2 is that the Messiah's king and kingdom will arrive despite man's devious dive. Uh, and, and if you're tracking with the news at any given time, it's easy to see uh, that that downward arc of man's devious dive uh, into sin as he seeks to control the world and, and not to have God part of it. But despite what man does, none of that is going to stop the coming of the Messiah. Heavy here on the word will. Uh, the Messiah's kingdom will arrive in God's time. Uh, that's what this great messianic psalm is about. It's a, it's a prophecy of the coming of the king uh, to tell you what God's plan is. So let's review what we've covered thus far. The first three verses uh, tells us what we can expect as we approach the timing of the coming of the Christ with his kingdom. What can we expect? Well, the psalmist says, uh, by way of review, you can expect man's rebellion to go to new heights. Um, I'm 62 years old. I've been paying attention to my world since I was a kid. Uh, you know, I lived through the, you know, the assassination of Kennedy, the Vietnam War, uh, et cetera. And as I've watched all that unfold in my lifetime, it just seems to me that rebellion is just, well, it's more pronounced than it ever was, even, even, even today. And when you look at that and you wonder what's going on, but you read the word of God, you have some insight because God says, you can expect this. You can expect for it to get dark before the brightness of the glory of the king shows up. So that's what uh, the first three verses tell us. The kingdom is coming, but before, prior to its coming, expect rebellion. Number two, by way of review, in verses four to nine, uh, we looked at you, you can expect God's reaction uh, to be pronounced against the rebels. Those who don't want God part of their life, don't want God part of their uh, political thinking, uh, their, any part of their lives, you can expect God to react against them. He's, he's never in heaven on his throne uh, static. He's always dynamic in dealing with man. What does it say he does? It says in verse four, which we studied last time, uh, God's reaction is very interesting. Uh, it's put into anthropom anthropomorphic terms, uh, speaking of God as one who laughs because, well, that's what we do. Uh, it, it says that God looks at what man wants to do, rebel against him. Uh, and it says, he who sits uh, in the heavens on his throne, what does he do? He laughs. He laughs. And it doesn't just leave it there. He says, it says he scoffs at them. I mean, he mocks them. Amazing. Uh, they think that they're able to uh, arrest the, the, the kingdom from his hand and build their own kingdom. And God just looks at them as he's omnipotent and he's omniscient and says to them, look, uh, in our vernacular, that just ain't happening. I don't know if God speaks that way. I don't want to be disrespectful, but uh, God's saying it's just, that's just not going to happen, that you're going to be able to create your own kingdom and have it bypass my kingdom. So I would put it to you this way. It is wiser to be part of God's kingdom now, uh, the spiritual kingdom, so you will be part of the physical kingdom when it merges with the spiritual kingdom when the Messiah arrives, than to miss it all together thinking that you were wiser than God. That's why Psalms starts with chapter one. There's two paths. There's the wise path that follows God and listens to God. There's the foolish path of the person who laughs at God and, and, and has no intention of ever following God. Uh, Psalm two then stops and tells you if you're a wise person, uh, you'll realize uh, God just smiles at you when you think that you are wiser than him and smarter than him. So we want to pick up where we left off. That was verse four. We want to get into verse five where God uh, tells you more what we can expect from him. It says in verse five, it says, then he, God, uh, shall speak to them. That's the godless. That's the rabble rousers. That's the revolters uh, that people don't want any part of God in their life. It says he will speak to them in his wrath and there's a parallelistic arrangement here that defines it further. It says, in distress, he will distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet, he says to the godless, I have set my king on my holy hill in Mount Zion, and I will declare the decree, God says, the Lord, that's Yahweh, uh, his covenantal name, has said to me, that's the son, the Messiah, you are my son, today I have begotten you. We'll dig into what that means in a minute. 
It says, ask of me, this is the father speaking to the son, ask of me at that point and I will give to you the nations, notice plural, all of them, the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them, that's the nations, the godless nations, with the rod of iron and you will dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Uh, what, what is God telling us here? What can we expect from God? Well, when he looks at the world trying to build a kingdom that keeps God out of the world, God just looks and smiles and laughs and mocks him and says, uh, you're not stopping me. And then he says in verse five, uh, what you can expect is that the, the time of wrath is going to come. The time of wrath. Uh, this particular uh, section of scripture, verses five through nine, leads to two exegetical questions. Uh, number one, uh, it causes you, if you're thinking about it, to ask, when will God openly, not covertly, but when will God openly oppose the godless and erect his Davidic empire, as he prophesies here? When, when will he do that? Uh, it says here in this uh, first uh, verse of this little uh, section, uh, then he will speak to them in his wrath. Well, that is a, a, that's an adverbial particle, and it's, uh, it's put at the front of the sentence out of normal word order, uh, it, it's put there on pers- person by the ins- inspiration of the Holy Spirit to, to cause you to see, if you were to read Hebrew, to know that, you, well, they put something at the front of the sentence that shouldn't be there. Why is it there? Well, God wants you to focus on the temporal nature of the particle and ask the question, God, when's this gonna happen? When, when is it gonna, gonna happen that you're coming in wrath? Uh, that, that is an emphatic. It's, it's as if God uh, rhetorically takes you by the shoulders shakes you and says, are you listening to me? You who build your lives against me and rebel against me. Uh, he says, there's coming the day when I will, I will speak. And he says, when I speak, it's not gonna be in grace, it's gonna be in wrath. Before we get into exactly what uh, God is saying there about his wrath and the whenness of it, uh, we need to stop and pause to understand that uh, God has also got a mercy. So there's a balance in his character. He's not uh, greater in one aspect of his character than another. There, he's He's perfection. Uh, so in, in wrath, God always remembers mercy because he's a balance between the two. Uh, Jonah found this out when he was sent on a divine mission to the Ninevites, the Assyrians that, that no Jew could stand. And God tells Jonah, as we know in that little story, it's kind of an amusing little story. He tells Jonah, I want you to go to your enemy, 600 miles from here, the Assyrians. I want you to go to the city of Nineveh, their capital, and I want you to preach the gospel to them, basically. Uh, and you, we all know how that story turned out. Uh, Jonah went the opposite direction. Uh, but then when he finally gets there, after God uh, sovereignly guides him back there, and, and he preaches the message, and we all know the story that the Ninevites hear the message of doom and judgment, and they turn to God in faith as a, as a, as a people. That was, by the way, some five to 600,000 people lived in that town at the time. So this town turns to God. And, and you would think that Jonah would be all excited because these Gentiles that he couldn't stand came to know God. But notice verse one of chapter four. It says, but, but it, which is the mercy of God, displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he became angry. Huh? He became angry over the fact that all these people got saved by him preaching the message of God? Yeah, he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and he said, notice his, notice his prayer. He says, ah, Lord, was this, and this is not, he's not being positive here. He says, ah, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I I fled previously to Tarshish, which is towards Spain. I ran in the opposite direction, for I know, notice, I know, not I think, but I know that you are what? Gracious, and you are a merciful God, and you are slow to anger, uh, and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents from doing harm. I knew it. I knew this about you. I knew that you're holy, that you would come in judgment, and you would judge the Ninevites, but I also knew that you were loving, kind, and merciful, and I, as a Jew, knowing what the Assyrians have done to us as a people, I was just wanting you to vaporize them, but you saved them, and because of that, Jonah says, I'm angry. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting? Uh, We learn a lot about the wrath of God just from the pen of Jonah. God is a balance between wrath and mercy. But just because God is a God of mercy to the Ninevites doesn't mean by definition that he will not ever come uh, in judgment on the day of judgment. Uh, Don't be deceived. And this is what the psalmist is talking about. God was merciful uh, at that time to the Ninevites, but that doesn't mean it's going to stop God from bringing the day of wrath to the world to then usher in the king of kings. 
The word for wrath is very interesting because it talks about him bringing uh, the, day, the day of wrath, the time of wrath. The word in uh, Hebrew is the word af, and af uh, is a word that literally denotes your nose. Uh, and I remember reading this in Hebrew class, I was thinking, God, that's kind of an odd word. Uh, and the teacher would always say, I want you to find, as this word started its etymological development, tell me why a, a nose would become the word for anger. Well, all you gotta do is go shopping during the COVID crisis. And uh, I know it's hard to do humor when there's nobody in the room, basically. But uh, I mean, think, think, think about this. Uh, I was at Walmart one night, and I was walking down the aisle where the bleach used to be, uh, which has kind of disappeared. And I was walking down the aisle and seeing what I could find to kind of, you know, kill germs at my house. And I noticed there was uh, like one of those Clorox packages where they have three containers of wipes, you know, different scents, but they all, you know, to wipe down surfaces. And there was one packet right in front of me. I was the only person in the aisle. It was right in front of me. You know, I'm six feet tall. All I had to do was grab it. And I was considering, do, do I really need that? Do I, you know, should I really spend the money on that? I've got other things at home. About that time, a lady that was about four feet tall came alongside of me, cut in front of me, grabbed it, and ran by me. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. At that point, if you were not a godly person, if I was not a Christian, uh, I can understand the word F. Because you could get so angry that your nose would turn, what color? Red, with anger. You ever been that mad? And maybe my Walmart il illustration doesn't do it for you because, well, I just let my wife go in there. Well, just, just drop yourself. When, when everybody's back to work, drop yourself on the freeway and just let somebody like horn into a line you're waiting to merge into. Just let somebody go off onto the side margin meeting and, and cut in front of you. I mean, not that that would ever happen, but when you get wild like a monkey inside your car, screaming and yelling, it's that F. That's, and you're gonna say this to yourself. It's like, oh, I just heard that sermon. I'm totally doing that. See, that's what God says. I, I can get so mad, God says, as it were, if I, if I had a nose, it would be turning bright red because I'm so mad over sin. Sin, sin. This is interesting, the word af uh, is the Hebrew word. Uh, in the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, it translates this, translates this word thumos. Now there's two main words in Greek for anger. One is orge, one is thumos. Orge is like a coal mine fire that burns under the ground and every once in a while it pops out and burns everything around it, then it goes away. That's that brooding kind of anger that a person has. Thumos is explosive. And it's like total. That, that's what God says when it comes down to sin, there's gonna come the day when he looks at the rebels of the world who shook their fists in his face for thousands of years and he's gonna finally rise from his throne and he's gonna say, my nose is bright red and it's thumos time. Boom, they won't even know what happened. Says uh, in a parallelistic way, God says, in, and in distress, I, I, I will distress them in my great deep displeasure. Uh, distress. Well, that's how the New King James Version translates this word, but I don't think that's the best translation of the Hebrew word. Uh, the NIV and the NAS translation uh, translate this in my estimation uh, more precisely. They say God will terrify them in his deep displeasure. Terrify. Uh, the word is pahal in Hebrew. Uh, it occurs 50 times in the Old Testament uh, and this particular word, uh, according to the Theological Word Book of the Old Testament by Harrison Archer, a uh, great book, I use it all the time for word meanings, uh, it means, uh, it's a word that expresses emotion from one who is confronted with something unexpected, threatening, and ultimately, personally, disastrous. Something happens and you are terrified. He says, God says, there's gonna come the day when, like in the day of Noah, when the door of the ark's gonna close and people will be terrified because they'll know it's the wrath of God. Terrified. You ever been terrified? Uh, I've been terrified a few times in my lifetime. I mean, terrified to the point where the hair on the back of your head lifts up. Now, I had heard about that from, you know, growing up as a kid, listening to my dad talk to all of his friends who were World War II vets and what happened to them in the jungles of, you know, Peleliu and all the things I heard as a kid. I might have heard about, you know, being under a mortar attack and whatever, and you know, the back of your hair raising up on the back of your head. I thought, that's just, there's no way that would happen. Well, 
Uh, that happened to me one night when I was in college. I was a janitor at Azusa Pacific University. I took care of the Hillside campus. That's where the art rooms were. That's where the football field was. That's where the basketball f uh, courts were, the football uh, team's locker room and everything. Every night I would drive up there to the Hillside campus, park my Camaro, clean all the art rooms, and then hike up a fire break through the forest up to the, the gym at night, it was really spooky, uh, and clean that place. Well, when I was doing this one year, it was when the Hillside Strangler was killing people and dumping their bodies in that area. And so I was kind of, you know, kind of nervous. Nobody knew where this guy was. And so one night I was walking up through that fire break in the darkness about 10 o'clock at night and uh, no flashlight or anything. I just thought I'll just, you know, I got to be macho. And I, I got up to the locker room, cleaned it. Uh, I was scared to death. I kept hearing the building creak and noises and stuff. I was kind of freaking out. And as I was walking back about 11 o'clock at night down through the fire break through the forest, I ran into probably, I don't know, probably eight to 10 coyotes. Have you ever heard coyotes scream? Uh, I never had, and I grew up in the desert. I, I've heard them howl, but I've never heard them scream. There I was in the forest, in the deep darkness, and I came upon a pack of them, and they began to scream, I thought it was the ultimate murder scene. I'm thinking the Hillside Strangler is here. I'm toast, it's over. Uh, at that precise moment, those coyotes began to scream. The hair on my head stood up and I totally believed all my dad's World War II buddies. That's fear, terror. God says when he comes in judgment that the godless are gonna be terrified. Why? That's a really good question. Why are they going to be terrified? Uh, they're going to be terrified because of three things. Number one, who they see, what they will see, and what they will hear. Well, what's going, how do we answer that question? Well, I, all you got to do is turn to Revelation chapter 16. Because we know uh, that God's judgment comes at the end of the tribulation. Uh, and so it starts with uh, seven seal judgments as the, the Lord opens the seven sealed scroll, which by the way is the title deed to the earth that he's gonna reclaim. Uh, he's the only one worthy to open the, the scroll judgments. As he breaks those seven seals, there's seven judgments. And the seventh seal is the first of the trumpet judgments. And then there's seven of those. And the seventh of the trumpet judgments is the first of the bowl judgments. And these all happen in a seven year time frame. And, and they compound on each other. So whatever happened in seal one is still impacting the earth when there's a trumpet judgment. But when you get to chapter 16, you see the, the wrath of God uh, displayed in verse seven. It says, then the seventh angel uh, poured out his bowl. This is the seventh angel of three judgments with seven judgments per each part of God's wrath. So 21 judgments on the earth. So this is, this is judgment number 21. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, what? It is done. You can imagine, you have lived through the entire tribulation and seen all that has gone on there. The Antichrist, I mean, cosmic judgments, unbelievable terror, and all of a sudden, right before the Lord appears, there's a voice that comes out of heaven, and this is what it says. It is done. What's done? The wrath of God. His plan to bring in his kingdom. Everything's ready. Don't you think that would terrify people when they hear this all around the earth, this echoing it is done from God's sphere? Uh, and it says there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. Uh, and then there was a great earthquake. Well, what kind of earthquake? I'm from California. I want to ask these questions. What kind of earthquake? Well, it says such as mighty and a great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. How big was the earthquake? Well, the city, the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations, it just levels them. And great Babylon, which they're going to rebuild, which is another study in and of itself, was remembered before God uh, to give her the cup of wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Uh, then every island fled away, that's some earthquake, and the mountains were not found, it levels the mountains. Um, and great hail from heaven fell upon them. Uh, how heavy was the hail? Uh, each hailstone weighed about a talent. That's about 85 pounds. Men then, notice, men didn't turn to God, what'd they do? Men blasphemed God because of the plague of hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. The largest earthquake uh, recorded by seismic uh, 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 monitors on the Richter scale 
was uh, uh, in uh, Valdiva, uh, Chile in 1960, May the 2nd. Registered 9.5 on a Richter scale. It was uh, anything above nine is just like almost total devastation. Can you imagine an earthquake that doesn't even register on the Richter scale? That, that makes that particular earthquake look like nothing? I mean, an earthquake that removes Hawaii, removes the Bahamas, uh, uh, an earthquake that levels Everest. That's what it says. Levels the earth. This is the fierceness of the wrath of God. Isaiah prophesied this in chapter 24, verse 19. Isaiah says the earth is, at that time will be violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly by the hand of God in his holiness. It says the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it and it will fall and it will not rise again. It will come a pass, he says in verse 21, in that day when God does this, that the Lord will punish on high the host of the exalted ones and on the earth the kings of the earth. This is the punishment of the demonic realm and the punishment of those on earth who rebelled against God. See, the day's coming. Isaiah says it's coming. The psalmist says this day is coming. And God says, I'm gonna bring terrifying things to get your attention that you should have worshiped me and not yourself in your own power. A hailstone weighing 80 pounds, imagine that. I did a little uh, reading this week and found out that a hailstone that weighs three point, that's 3.1 inches in diameter, 3.1 inches in diameter, descends at a rate of 120, 110 miles per hour. And it's only three and a half inches wide. Imagine an 80 pound hailstone. God says, I'm gonna pummel you because you rejected my prophets, you rejected the scriptures, you attacked the church, etc. You attacked my people Israel. I'm gonna get your attention because the king is coming. See, there's a day coming. When is the day? As we asked a few minutes ago, when is the day? Well, because Revelation 19, which introduces us to the coming of the, of the Christ at the end of the tribulation, since it quotes Psalm 2 about Jesus coming and, and ruling and reigning with a rod of iron, he just told us when this is going to occur. Notice verse 11, uh, at the end of the tribulation, says in Revelation 19, John says, now I saw heaven open and behold, there was a white horse. And he who sat on it, his name was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, not like the people today, he judges and he makes war. His eyes were a flame of fire. His, his, on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except for himself. He was clothed with a flying robe dipped in blood. And his name was called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed on white horses. And out of his mouth goes a sharp, sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. That, those are the rebels that have been predominantly arrayed against them for thousands of years. It says he himself will rule them with the rod of iron and he treads the, upon the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God. He has a name on his robe and on his thigh as he's riding his horse. What's his name? King of kings. He's Lord of lords. And notice it's capitalized. It's not because he's screaming. It's because he's making an emphatic statement. The king appears. In the, in the middle of all of this evil, at the end of the tribulation, God says, I'm gonna use 21 judgments to get your attention, to turn you to me. And it says that when he does these things, the world just continues to blaspheme God. And then Jesus appears, and it's quite clear who he is. We know from the scriptures, many scriptures, Joel chapter two, Amos chapter five, verses 18 to 20, that when Jesus appears, the day of his arrival, all the luminaries in the cosmos will be turned off, complete black. Is, everything's blacked out. And it, why? Because it, it's, it's showing as a metaphor the, the blackness of man's sin, and in that blackness appears the glory, the Shekinah glory of Christ. Imagine the day. The saints will be shouting hallelujah. The, the lost will be terrified, as prophesied in Psalm chapter two. And it says here that he will then at that moment break them as easily as a potter breaks a, a clay pot with an iron rod. No problem at all. See, you can't stop the coming of the kingdom of God. Uh, that king and that kingdom are coming. For the saint, it gives you great hope. If you're not a saint, you're still a sinner. Uh, this is, well, good reason to wake up and entrust to Christ because the king is coming. Uh, you, back in ancient times, uh, Dr. Alan Ross, who taught me Hebrew at, at Dallas Theological Seminary, says this about the breaking of clay pots and probably where the psalmist got his imagery. He says, this figure may be based on the Egyptian custom in which the name of each city under the king's dominion was written on a little uh, votive jar and placed in the temple of his God. 
Then if the people of that city rebelled, the Pharaoh would smash that city's little jar in the presence of the deity. Such a symbolic act would terrify the rebellious, not that the city had much of a chance of withstanding the Pharaoh in the first place. What did he do? He walked in and just smashed their city's little clay jar to say, I own you. Uh, I'm the king. See, this is uh, God's way of saying through the pen of the psalmist, um, I will take the rebellious nature of all the nations who have not wanted me to be any part of, of what they're doing and have wanted to stop me from coming, and I will instantly, with the word of my mouth, destroy them at the end of the tribulation. That's when it's going to happen. Leads to a second question. Question number two. Why will God use wrath to erect his, his empire, his Davidic empire? Uh, it's going to take a second to develop that. Look at verse six. God says to the rebellious, yet I have set, not will set, but I have set my king, that's the Messiah, on my holy hill of Zion, which is Jerusalem, where the temple is. Again, the opening word uh, uh, is, is emphatic because it's, it's, it's out of word order. And God's, again, taking man, he's shaking him and he's saying, you better listen to me. It's as if I have already erected the king in the kingdom. It's as if it's already a done deal. He says, I have set my king on my holy hill. Uh, who's the king? What's the great Davidic king of kings? the Messiah. Psalm 89 talks about the Davidic empire that was promised to David. If you go back and you read 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 12 to 16, it's the promise of the Davidic king that would come over an, an eternal empire. It says in verse 2 of Psalm 89, for I have said mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness, uh, you will establish uh, it in the very heavens. God says, I have made my covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever and I'll build up your throne to all generations. See, the, the Davidic covenant from 2 Samuel 7, God says, I'm gonna give it to the ultimate Davidic king, Jesus, the anointed one. Nothing can stop that. You see Jesus when he arrives on the planet, how the scriptures talk about him. Luke chapter one, verse 31, Dr. Luke writes, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. Who is he? Well, you'll call his name Jesus. Who's he gonna be? He will be great. And he will be called the son of the highest and the Lord will give to him, what? The throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob for how long? Forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. As prophesied, you know, the king is coming. Uh, and what we see here in, uh, in verses six and seven is the coronation of the king. In God's mind, it is such a done deal. It's as if it's happened, which means it's unstoppable. Verse seven says, God says, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. This doesn't mean that Jesus was created, as some have erroneously assumed. This is coronation language. This is the, the father telling the son, uh, there's a day when you're coronated as the Messianic Davidic king. Well, when, when will that happen? Well, Acts chapter 13 tells us when. Acts 13, verse 33. It's applied to the resurrection of Christ, the, the king. It says in verse 32, we declare you good tidings that the promise which was made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled this for our, us and our children, and that he has raised up Jesus, the resurrection. As it is also written in the second Psalm, what was written? You are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. God, God through the, the, the pen of uh, Dr. Luke in Acts 13 says, uh, at the resurrection of my son, well this is a coronation day, because he just defeated sin and death. So if anybody can ask the father for the, the, the kingdom, it's, it's the res, risen Christ. To me, that's the, the beginning of his coronation. So he says in verse eight, God says to the son, now that he's resurrected, verse eight, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. God says, son, now that you've, you, you've done the bidding to redeem man, uh, now you're situated as the resurrected one, defeated sin and Satan, now you can ask me for that Davidic kingdom. And Jesus has asked for that kingdom and he's gonna be given that kingdom. And if you know Christ, you're gonna be part of that kingdom Talk about hope, because when you look at all the political mess around us, all around the world, uh, it just tells you man can't fix his situation. That it, it, it's just screaming for one to come and bring the ultimate kingdom of peace to the world. That will be the Messiah Jesus, and the Father's gonna give it to him. Last point I wanna make, which is really a simple point, 
uh, as the, the king and the kingdom are coming and you can't stop it, what should we expect? Lastly, verses 10 to 12, you should expect God's remedy for rebels. God gives rebels a remedy. And if you're that person that is still shaking your fist in God's face, still thinking that you're smarter, wiser than he is, uh, God has a word for you. Uh, and it's a, it's a word of, it's interestingly enough, it's a word of grace. It's a word of grace. Notice what he says. Now, therefore, if you're a rebel, what's he say? Be wise, O kings. Secondly, be instructed, you judges of the earth. What should you do? Serve the Lord. How should you do it? With fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. And then lastly, if you follow his advice in verses 10 and 11, he says you are blessed if you put your trust in him. Command after command after command, God says, I really want you to wake up so I don't judge you. I really want you to be part of my kingdom so my wrath does, isn't brought against you. See, God wants, wants to be gracious to those who rebel against him. You know, we, we tend to be like Jonah and want God just to deal with evil. I mean, just vaporize evil and bring the king in the kingdom. Uh, at the end of this great eschatological messianic psalm, God says, no, I want to reach out to those who don't know me, who are the rebels who are running from me, and I want to give them some advice. Number one, be wise. Be wise. Be wise how? By realizing that it's wise to follow the king of kings, Jesus, and not your own kingdom. It's wise to do that. Number two, he says, be instructed. If, he says here, judges. He said, if you are a, the judge type person, a judgmental kind of person, uh, he says it's time to use logic and reason to, to think about who the person and work of Jesus Christ really is and, and come to know him. He says, be, be instructed in truth, not in falsity. Uh, number three, serve the Lord with fear, verse 11. Because when you come to know Christ as the Savior, as the King of Kings in your old life, when you step off the throne of your life and ask Christ to step on the throne of your life, you will serve him. I mean, it just happens naturally because you love him and you will do it with fear. Why? Well, because you, you recognize he's holy. And there's that certain degree of reverential fear that he's holy other than me. He might be my heavenly father once I come to know him, but I still respect who he is as God. It's that reverential fear. And then he says also, you will wise up and you will rejoice with trembling. I find that really interesting. It doesn't seem like the two go together, but they do. Because when you come to know uh, Jesus as the king of kings, you will rejoice in that new relationship because now you have meaning in your life. But when you stop and think about that relationship in the middle of the night, there's a certain degree of trembling about it because indeed he is the holy one. Isaiah chapter six, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, even the great prophet Isaiah looked at himself and says, woe is me, I'm an unclean man. See, he saw his sin. See, that's that rejoicing that I know him, but trembling because I see who he is. Is that you? Do you rejoice? Do you have that joy in your heart? Even in a COVID crisis. Do you have joy? I have joy. I have joy because I know the king is coming. And I know the world's gonna descend into darkness, but the king is coming. Lastly, he says, pay homage to the king. King James translation says, kiss the son, lest he be angry. It's that whole concept of a, of, a, of a servant before the throne of a king getting down to the ground and kissing the, the, the sandals of the king saying, you're greater than I. See, this is humility. See, hell will be full of people who were full of themselves, prideful. See, it's the humble who say, I, I need God and I need him now and I don't have any problem now in, in bowing before him and bowing and kissing the feet of Christ and saying, would you please be my king? See, the king is coming, and if you're a rebel, God's telling you, I want you to be prepared, and be prepared by being my son, and I will shower my grace down upon you, and I would be remiss of my job as a pastor if I didn't call you as a rebel, well, to bow before the son and ask for him to be your savior, and he will redeem you, and if you're a Christian, two things. Number one, Realize the knowledge of the coming kingdom should give you peace in your heart. No matter what happens in our world, as it's fallen apart, it's peace that God is in control. Number two, uh, the fact the king is coming should take you as a Christian and help you to understand you have a mandate to warn the world that the king is coming. Far wiser to be a king's son than those who are opposed to the king. Let's pray. God, we give you the scriptures today. Uh, they are sobering. Uh, they are ominous. They're also full of great hope uh, and encouragement for
For it tells us that you have your hand on the wheel of time and soon and very soon you shall appear in all of your glory. And we thank you for what lies ahead. And may we as your saints be pre preaching forth the gospel of the King of Kings. And for those in our church that don't know you, might this sermon be that which moves them to embrace the King of Kings, Jesus, by faith and be saved. In Christ's name, amen.